So here we go. Revelation 16, verse 1, right? Put your seatbelts on. Here we go, right? Verse 1 says, Then I heard a loud voice, right, from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. A loud voice. Listen, John hears this loud voice from the temple. Emphasis on loud and the enormity of these judgments. These judgments, judgments are the last judgments. They are the largest. They are the most devastating of all judgments that God gives. Next to being cast into the lake of fire. And so as we look about this, we will hear this again at the seventh bowl. In verse 17, when we come to it, these bowls are seven final judgments in the tribulation. The end is coming very quickly. The bowls are supernatural acts. I want you to get it. They're supernatural acts of Almighty God on the earth. There's no natural scientific, listen, explanations here. These are all supernatural acts that come from a holy God. Look at verse 2, and he says, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore. My one underscore, underscore sore. On the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. So when we look at it, it says, First the angel responded immediately to God's command. He immediately came out of the temple. And listen, and the bowls are like, can you picture shallow saucers? They're very shallow, so they can dispense these uh, the, the the judgments very quickly, very quick, quickly, very briefly, and just dump it all out, right? These will come very rapidly. These bowls, there's seven of them, will come one after the other, and they'll be in rapid succession. Man, we are coming to the close at the end of the second three and a half years of the tribulation here. This is what we're seeing. And so these bowls are going to be thrown out very rapidly. This bowl results... In a sore, this first one, and it afflicts the people who took the mark of the beast. This sore is, and this sore, the word sore here talks about it's a festering sore, and it's painful. It's incurable sores, no relief. It's pure physical torment on the person who has it. And it's only the people that have the mark of the beast, right? For all those who have rejected Jesus, that's who it's for. The people that take the mark of the beast are the ones that reject the Savior. These sores, however, will not affect believers who did not take the mark of the beast. Think about it. Their names have been written before the foundation of the world in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Revelation 13 and 8 kind of alluded to that for us. This comes on all those who will follow the Antichrist. They're the ones that get the sore. For they receive the mark of the beast demonstrating their allegiance to the evil one. They would not listen. They would not recant. They would not repent of their sinfulness. And they continue to be rebellion, rebellious to the Lord. And it's amazing because as we go through these bowls, you kind of see, you know, how can they sustain such devastating and misery in their life and yet still rep uh, not repent to the Lord God Almighty? The sore is a singular sore, if you notice, too. It's one sore that's on their body. Where do you think that sore is located at? Right? Could be where? Well, let's, let's look at uh, Re Revelation 13, 16 says, and he causes all the small and the great. We had already talked about this before, and I want to bring it out. And the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their what? Right hand and on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. Either the name of the beast or the number of his name. I kind of think that the sore is probably where the mark is. That's what I think. I mean, I think about some of the things that we go through in life and shots and vaccines and stuff and how things kind of hit us sometimes. But, but I want us to look at the, let's go on to the second bowl. So the first one is the sore. The second one, verse 3, it says, The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. Now the effects of these bowls will be quick. It'll be like a snowball running down, picking up more snow, getting larger and larger as it goes. And it gets faster and faster. That's how these bowls are going to come. They're going to be one upon the other. In fact, it's going to be such where these people that had the sores before, if they were ever to be healed, they're going to get the, the next bowl before they could even be healed. It's going to be so quick in succession. Before they heal from this or the next bowl will start and it will be difficult for everybody. Very similar to the plagues of Moses in the Old Testament. 
of the Nile, right? Also like the second trumpet in Revelation we talked about. Revelation 8.8, it said, The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood. And the third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. You know, you ever think about that? Oceans affect about, they cover about 70% of the world's surface is covered by an ocean, by water. Amen? So think about this. This bowl will have a global impact, not like what we just read out of Revelation 8. This bowl, the final, the last judgment, is going to affect every ocean and every sea in the world. Every single one. How God does this supernaturally, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. He's God, I'm not. I don't know how he's going to do it, but it's, everything's going to be blood. You know, uh, I used to go hunting, you know. And uh, yes, your pastor went hunting. I used to go hunting. And used to go deer hunting. And you know, whenever that blood is let out, what happens to the blood when it's outside the body after a time? Yeah, it gets hard, right? So can you imagine what this would be like in the oceans? I know it's kind of gross, but at the same time, you kind of think about it, you go, I can't imagine. I mean, the oceans, you think about it. The effects will be like, the only way I could think of exp ex expressing it would be like um, the thing that we suffer with here in Florida is the red tide. What happens when the red tide hits? It kills everything right there, right? It kills everything, right? It's a bad thing. But imagine the entire, every ocean, 70% of the water is, is affected by this bowl. It kills everything on the planet. It kills everything in the ocean. I mean, think about all the life that's teeming in the oceans right now. Every whale, every fish, everything. And it's going to destroy each and every one of them. The effects would be like everything in the world's oceans will die. Can you imagine everything? <laughs> Listen, everything. This will be a testimony, listen, of the wickedness of man on the earth. It's going to be a testimony to our wickedness on the earth, our sinfulness. This is also a reversal of how God created everything from back in Genesis 1.21. When he put all those animals in, he said, let them oceans be teeming life full of these animals, right? Look at verse 4. Verse 4 Let's go to the third one. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of the waters. And they also became what? Blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets. And you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and the righteous are your judgment. So when I think about this bowl affects the rivers and the streams like the second bowl affected all the oceans. So this is basically contaminating every water system and source that there is globally on the planet. This will become like blood too with a critical supply of fresh water to remain. It's going to be horrible. The third trumpet resulted in a poisoning of one. When we talk about the trumpets, the third trumpet, it was a third of the world's freshwater supply. But this affects the whole entire earth during this time. Also remember, remember the two witnesses we talked about some chapters ago? The two witnesses uh, we studied about, the power, they had the power to shut down the rain from falling in the sky, right? In Revelation eleven six, 6, these two witnesses, they said, these have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. There will be no wind. Think about this. There will be no wind to move the clouds. If the clouds can't move, the weather system cycle is disrupted. So there will be no for making rain. There will be no rain upon the earth. This will cause unthinkable hardship and suffering for every person that's left alive. This scene will cause people to wonder how a God of compassion and mercy and grace could send such judgment. So here lies a brief interlude right here where the angel in this particular verse, listen, defends what God is doing, the righteous judgment of God in a song. He did it in chapter 15, but he also does it here in verse 5 when he says, And I heard the angel of the water saying what? 
to God. Righteous are you, O God. Righteous are you. Who are, who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. When I think about that, I think about, you know, people, I've heard people say, well, why would a holy and just God allow, sends anybody to hell? And my answer to that is, he never sends anybody to hell. He never has sent not one person ever to hell. A person goes to hell because they choose to sin and rebel against the holy God who provided a sacrifice with his own son and his own blood. The life is in the blood and is in the blood of the lamb who was shed for all of us. God never sends anybody to hell as humans. We go by our own volition, our own choice. When we deny the sacrifice of Jesus and the Son, the blood that was shed for our sin, when we deny that, man, that's why we go to hell. Because we deny the Savior. So make sure this morning, God doesn't ever send anybody to hell. Make sure you are in the faith this morning. Let's go on to uh, verse 5. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you, which I just read, who are and who were given praise to Holy One because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, deserve it. How could God send out his judgment to people on the earth? We must realize God is a just God. He is a just God. He means what he says. He said what he means. Everyone, listen, gets their just reward. Every person on earth gets their just reward. Listen, the Bible says we're going to do, we're going to reap what we what? Sow. We sow to the flesh, we're going to reap what? Destruction for all eternity. The angels of these waters defends God's righteous judgment. Only God is the Holy One to bring such judgment. Talk about payback, right? Talk about payback. These people end up drinking the very blood that they spilled or allowed to spill on the earth. In vengeance to the martyr saints. Remember the martyr saints under the altar in the presence of God? Listen, remember John heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous. This is verse 7. Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. God's judgments are always, his character is always true. He is always righteous. In fact, Revelation 6, 9, the, 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 the martyred saints during the tribulation who were killed uh, because they didn't take the mark or whatever the case may be, they were murdered. And see, there was a special place under the altar in the throne room of God for them where they were crying out for, for vengeance, asking, Oh Lord, when will you avenge our debts? When will we... And this may be the very time right here where he's avenging the deaths of all these saints that are, uh, that are in heaven that are killed during this time. This may be the very answer to the prayers that they were asking of God. Look at verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. I don't understand that. Do you get that? And they blaspheme the God who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. Now the first three bowls are poured out on the earth, right? But here this bowl is poured out differently. It's poured out on the sun. This earth will experience extreme heat exceeding any human experience ever. Talk about climate change. Right? We talk about climate change. They ain't seen nothing, Jack. Climate change. Man, listen, I'm telling you. The people will suffer as if the atmosphere was on fire. They will suffer. The people scorched will be those who have the mark of the beast. Again. For they worship the image. Think about the polar ice caps of the earth. The devastation, the floods everywhere, widespread damage and loss of life is going to take place. Devastation globally. Transportation on the seas will be impossible. You would think that with all that's going on, people would repent. But no, they don't repent. They don't repent. Like their leader, the Antichrist, the people will continue to hate God, refusing to repent. If they would, if they would, it would give God glory, right? As being just and a righteous God. Look at verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain and they blaspheme the god of heaven 
because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. So what does God do? He turns out the lights as He did in Egypt in Exodus 10, verse 21. That's what He does. He turns up the intensity of suffering by turning out the lights. Can you imagine if all light was dis- distinguished right now? We would be a miserable of all people. You couldn't see this far in front of your face. You couldn't see it all. What would that, you ever been in a cave? And you went down, and you walked on the trail, and you get down there at the bottom. I don't know about you, but I'm always thinking about how that cave, I said, oh, that thing fall on me or what, you know? I think about earthquakes when I'm in a cave, you know? That's a bad thing to think about, right? So, so we're in the cave, you know? Have you ever had them turn the lights out while you're in the cave? Utter darkness. I can't imagine. So this is going to affect everything, and this is going to be on a global scale. I don't know how God's going to do it. It's supernatural, but he's going to do it. It's going to be poured out on a global scale. No matter where it is poured, the whole kingdom is going to be darkened. The beast himself will be helpless before the power of God. I think of the sores on the people, the foul oceans that we've talked about. No drinking water, intense heat, all the blackness of everything that's going on where they can't see a blessed thing. This will all bring unbearable misery to everybody on the planet. Yet they will still refuse to repent. How hard can a heart get? It goes to show you how hard our hearts can get. Our hearts can get just as hard as these folks' hearts. And sometimes they, they are that way. This is the last, also the last reference to them not repenting in the Scripture. It's the last reference of them not repenting. The first five calls, listen, were God's final call to repent. This now means that they are all confirmed in their unbelief. They are confirmed in their unbelief. The final two bowls will finish everything. Everything. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and his water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. And then verse 15 he says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. And he says, Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not be walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew, Hebrew is called Armageddon. Listen, in this scripture there's no assault on humanity right here. This sets the stage for what is to come next. The great river Euphrates will dry up. It will dry out. We saw in chapter 9, and, and, and listen, of the sixth trumpet, a release of 200 million demons that were bound, bound under the Euphrates River were set free. In Revelation 9, 14, listen to what it says. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet released the four angels who are bound where? At the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I can't even fathom 200 million. I've, I heard the number of them. John writes, the Euphrates River is considered, listen to this, the longest and the most significant river in the Middle East. Called the Great River is what it's called. It flows from Mount Ararat, which I think is interesting that it begins at Mount Ararat, where Noah ship rested right the the ark rested and it goes all the way 1800 miles to the persian gulf that's how long it is that's one big old long river right it goes through like three different countries you think about iraq and you think about syria and it goes through one more turkey right and you think about it the garden of eden was located in close proximity to this river in genesis 2 the river forms the eastern boundary to israel's territory The kings of the earth will be drawn by demons to come and fight the battle of Armageddon. 
These demons will come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet, which this describes that unholy trinity. It's an unholy trinity. And when I think about the Euphrates River, listen, I was sitting there and I was Googling about the Euphrates River. You know, the Euphrates River is almost dried up now. I want to challenge you. Go on YouTube and look it up. You will see, I mean, this is, you're talking about a mighty, mighty river. And listen, in Turkey and these different countries put so many dams up that they've dammed back water for irrigation and agriculture, right? So much so that by the time the water comes, gets down to Iraq, there's hardly any water left. And now the Iraqis are having to relocate because the water is almost completely gone. Tell me, folks, we're not close. Man, we've got to wake up and see that, listen, our redemption draws near out of this world. It's coming so close. Look it up. Check it out. And also, you know, they were talking about how it exposed. They exposed some things. Uh, they, they exposed some of these open caverns. And there are these little formations underneath there that I can't even think of a man. I mean, this river has been there ever since the Garden of Eden. Think about it. Ever since time began, this river has flowed. So the stage is being set all the way through. The Bible says in verse 15, listen, they will seduce the kings. Listen, these, these, these that will seduce the kings of the east and making the journey to Megiddo of Armageddon. But believers are encouraged here as well. In verse 15, he said, behold, I'm coming like a what? A thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Listen, these people will be ready for battle. Only those who, who Jesus finds prepared for when he returns will be blessed. That goes for us as well, right? Mount Megiddo is located about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. North of Jerusalem. Let's go to the seventh bowl, the final bowl. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. And the loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done! And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Listen, there was a great earthquake. Such as there had not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nation fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds mm, each, came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. Because its plague was extremely severe. They blasphemed God anyway. Listen, this... Last bowl is the final outpouring of God's divine wrath on sinners in the present earth we see here. This will be the worst in the history of the world. This angel dumps this bowl in the air or the atmosphere, which I thought was interesting. Because who is the prince of the power of the air? In the book of Ephesians, Satan is. So this bowl was thrown out into the air, into the atmosphere of the air, right? The earth, the sea, the water, the sun, the air are all targets of God's holy judgment. The bowl is dumped, and then a loud voice came out of the temple throne saying, It is done! The climax of the final day of the Lord. It is done. Perfect tense. Describes a complete action with ongoing results. Hey, remember when Jesus was on the cross? Remember in John 19, John 19 and 30, when he cried out, what did he say? It is done. It is finished, right? It is all finished. And it is finished. When Christ hung on the cross, He finished everything for you and I if we would just believe in Jesus Christ. We won't have to worry about none of the stuff that I'm talking about up here. If you know Jesus is the Savior, listen, you're going to be forever saved. You're going to, you're going to avoid the penalty uh, of what happens in the seven years of tribulation. We're going to avoid it. Because we're going to be snatched out of here before it starts. God's judgment of His Son on Calvary's cross provides salvation for each and every one of us, if we would receive it. We were repentant sinners. But the bowls bring judgment to the unrepentant sinners. That's what the bowls are for. They're for the unrepentant at heart. 
The bowl will affect the atmosphere, severe lightning and flashes of thunder. There will be an awful earthquake like there was at Calvary. Remember there's an earthquake at Calvary and it said it split open and some of the graves opened up and some of the dead in the past were resurrected and came and walked throughout the city. Man, there's all kinds of things about the earthquake there. But this earthquake is going to be different than even that that was done at, at, at Calvary. This is going to be a global earthquake. How many have ever experienced a global earthquake? I haven't. I've experienced an earthquake, but not a global one, right? It went around the wor- world, right? It's going to shake like never before. In fact, it's going to shake so severely that Jerusalem is going to be split in three ways. Jerusalem is going to be split in three ways, and it's not split in three ways to destroy it, but to enhance it in preparation for the coming of our Messiah for his millennial kingdom. That's why it's being split the way it is. Not to destroy it. Christ is coming to the holy city to rule and to reign from it. The Antichrist will be defeated by the Lamb of God. All the cities will stop. Listen, in the Antichrist retreats, Babylon will drink the cup of severe wrath of God. In chapter 17 and 18, we're going to study later. We're going to talk about later. The earthquakes also prepare the earth for the millennial reign of Christ. Still, the unrepentant will blaspheme God because of the hail. Hmm. Just to think, signs and wonders won't convince people to believe the gospel. We know that's true, right? We know that's true. We know that's true because Jesus, when he taught about Lazarus and the rich man, right? And Lazarus was begging, begging for Jesus to send somebody down, send somebody down to the earth. Uh, the, 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 uh, the rich man in hell is begging God, send somebody down to warn my family members, warn my family members. And what did he say? He said, if they don't listen to the preachers, they're not going to listen if somebody was even raised from the dead. And we see the evidence of that today. It's hard to talk about Jesus if somebody's not going to walk away. Oh, I don't want to hear about that myth. But you're going to hear about it. Either now, hear about it now and be blessed, or hear about it later and be thrown away. That's going to be a sad day. Sad in my heart. Today, sinners, if you hear God's voice at all, do not harden your hearts. Please don't harden your hearts. Hebrews 4, 7 says this. He again fixes a certain day. Today. Today's the day. Saying through David after uh, so long a time, just as he had been said before. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Every time you reject God when he's squeezing your heart, you harden your heart. Every time when you reject God, uh, when God is trying to get your attention and you reject. You know, I always tell people that when uh, we leave, you know, and I gave an invitation, you know, everybody's going to make a decision in this room today. Every one of us is going to make a decision, amen? And, it, and, and no decision is a decision. It's always a decision. So I want to encourage you this morning, as we think about these things that are going on, let God break your heart for a lost person. All he wants us to be is the messengers. And we're messengers by what we say, by how we act and what we do. That, that all brings a message to the world. The love that we share and that we show to people, it all sends a message. And when we don't share the love like we should, it sends a message too. And you got to be careful of that. I've done that many times. I have to always check myself all the time. And I fail. And boy, I don't like it. I beat myself up when I fail. Are you saved today? Do you know Jesus is your Savior today? With every eye closed, every head bowed, listen. If you're in the sound of my voice and you've never trusted Jesus to save you from your sinfulness, I ask you this morning to allow Jesus to touch your heart. He's already touched your heart. I ask you to uh, be obedient to the squeeze of your heart by a holy Savior. Because you don't come to the Lord unless the Spirit of the Lord draws you to Him. But if God is squeezing your heart this morning, I want to encourage you this morning. Let Jesus in. Don't put it off.
Think about Brother David White and how he shared his testimony at the beginning of the service. Going to church, reading his Bible, teaching, preaching, whatever he was doing, right? And then God had to basically smack him down. And that's a good thing. Because he wakes us up when he smacks us down. That's a loving father who would discipline his own and get his attention to turn toward Jesus the Savior. To realize that all of us are powerless to do any good thing, but we need a Savior to grant the power to us, through us, to reach lost people and to be a witness to the world. You know Jesus your Savior this morning? If you don't, I challenge you just to ask Him into your heart right now. Just say something like to say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you shed your blood to wash away my every sin. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart right now and to change me this day. And Lord, I want to walk with you the best way I know. I want to turn away from all my junk in my life. I want to chase you with a whole heart. Lord, help me to do that today. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do it. Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need your help to help me, to lead me, to guide me, to show me the way. I thank you, Lord, for touching my heart this morning. I pray, Lord, that every heart and mind has been touched here today. And Lord, if there's anything in our Christian brothers and sisters' heart that shouldn't be there, Lord, that you would evacuate it out of their heart, that they would confess it, repent of it, and get that slate clean again before they walk out these doors this morning. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Help me to get it right so you can use me freely in the lives of other people who need Jesus so desperately. Lord, I thank you for our time this morning in your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would encourage us, help us, Lord, the rest of the week just to meditate. Meditate on these tribulations, on these judgments. Help us to think about names of people who don't know who you are, who will face that tribulation period, Lord, if you do not tarry. And help us, Lord, to get busy, to be a demonstrating of who Jesus is through our conversation and our character and our conduct. And that we would do it wholeheartedly in love for you and in love for the others that we speak to. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for all you've done here today. I thank you for David's testimony. Thank you for the music and the praise team. I thank you for all you're doing. We thank you for this day in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.